a real pleasure to be uh, <clears throat> invited back to Google Zeitgeist. If I, I, I think the last time I spoke at this was many, many years ago in, in Phoenix. And if memory serves, uh, my talk was a critical examination of my decision to agree to talk at Google Zeitgeist. <laughs> um, incredibly, I got invited back. And I, um, so I thought as, as an encore, what I would do is uh, div, do a critical examination of why all of you were invited to Google Zeitgeist. Um, now, there's a standard answer to that, which is that this is a gathering of the best and the brightest, and all of you have reason to believe that you are the best and the brightest. Um, but my question is, how do you know you're the best and the brightest? Um, and what I want to suggest this morning is that there's a great deal uh, more uncertainty over that question than you may uh, care to admit, and um, that paradoxically, this is a very good thing. Um, so I want to focus uh, uh, in, the, in the brief time that I have on the role of gatekeepers, because meritocracies of the sort that we've erected in our world are run by uh, gatekeepers. And um, I would like to advance a series of propositions um, to suggest that gatekeepers are really, really bad at what they do. Um, so there's going to be uh, four of these propositions. Um, Proposition one is that gatekeepers very often do not understand the meritocracy um, that they're supposed to be keeping the, uh, watching the gates for. Um, so uh, tons of examples, but the one I uh, will focus on is, I want to focus on is um, the, the NIH, the National Institutes of Health. Um, this is one of the most consequential uh, meritocracies in the world probably. NIH has a budget of $40 billion a year. Um, they get 80,000 grant applications a year, which represent I mean, an extraordinary percentage of the most crucial research we do uh, in, in the world. And they put together groups of experts who grade each one of those grant applications on a scale of 10 to 90, where 10 is fantastic and 90 is terrible, right? So this is a classic meritocracy guarded by a group of expert uh, gatekeepers. So a couple years ago, the guy uh, who, the deputy director of extramur extramural research at NIH, the guy who's running this process, decides to try and verify how good the process is, right? So when you do a score on a grant application, you're making a prediction of how good you think that research is going to turn out to be. So his question was, well, how good are these predictions? So he does a very simple analysis where, you know, in medicine, the way we uh, judge the quality of research is how many citations are made to that research once it's finished. So he says, let's simply correlate the grant score on an application with the number of citations it gets so once, it's, once the research is finally finished. So what does he discover? He discovers that the correlation between your score and how good your research ends up being is modest to non-existence, right? Now, um, we're talking about one of the most crucial meritocracies in modern society. We're talking about $40 billion of intellectual activity, and the guy running the whole show takes a look and discovers, oh, the experts who are manning who, the gates to this particular meritocracy don't actually know what they're doing. So why doesn't gatekeeping work in this, function, in this, in this example? Well, one is that maybe it's just impossible to predict wh who's a good researcher and who isn't. Maybe that's impossible. Or maybe it is that the groups of experts, um, by virtue of being experts, belong to a particular generation of medical research and are hopelessly out of touch with what the next generation of research is supposed to be all about. It doesn't really matter. The point is that this is a meritocracy that isn't actually a meritocracy, right? My favorite response to uh, this guy, Dr. Lauer's paper, is a bunch of microbiologists published this paper where they said, well, the only rational thing to do now is to tell all of the grant reviewers to go home, to shut down that entire cumbersome process of trying to evaluate all of these 80,000 grant applications. Just have a big, round, cylindrical container, put all the applications in the container, and pick them out at random, and that should be how we uh, govern the grant process in this country. Um, that strikes me as a system that makes a great deal of sense. Um, okay, proposition number two. 
Uh, meritocracies don't work sometimes because they are run for the, uh, for the benefit of gatekeepers. Right? So the, again, many examples. My favorite one is the LSAT. I got so um, obsessed with the LSAT a couple years ago that I actually took it. I challenged my assistant um, to an LSAT contest. Um, and uh, so we all know about the LSAT. It's, uh, it's six sections, you know, reading, problem solving, logic problems, I've forgotten the others, um, writing. You get 35 minutes for each section, and on the basis of your, your score determines whether you get into an elite law school, whether you get into an elite law school de determines whether you get an elite job once you graduate, and whether you get an elite job once you graduate determines whether you get uh, things like appointments to the Supreme Court and invitations to Google Zeitgeist. Um, so what is the LSAT conceptually? Well, uh, psychometricians make a distinction between power tests and speed tests. So a speed test is where I give you a whole lot of relatively easy questions, and I'm interested to see how many you can answer uh, in a given amount of time, right? So video games are really very often speed tests, right? We face a constraint and we see how well you do under that constraint. Power test is where I give you really hard questions, and all I'm really interested in is how many of those questions you can get right. So Scrabble tends to be, is really a power game. Untimed chess is a, is a power game. So what's the LSAT? Well, the LSAT is a series of very, very hard questions, but it, we require that the test taker complete them in a limited period of time. And the time constraint is um, so strict that it's deliberately strict because we want to make it so hard, we want to make it hard enough that the average test taker cannot answer all the questions in the allotted time. So uh, what we have here is what a psychometrician would call a speeded power test, right? We're collecting power data with a speed constraint. So here's the question. Why do we collect it with a speed constraint, right? Why is there a 35-minute limit on the six sections of the LSAT? So take a look at this. This is a, I don't know, our first slide. Where is my first? Here we are. So we have two test takers here. We have tortoise and hare. And let's start with hare. Hare is, uh, we all know hares. Hare is super speedy, very confident. He answers every one of the 101 questions on the LSAT uh, in the time allotted. He gets 82 of them correct for an accuracy rate of 81.2. And he has an LSAT score of 165, which puts him in the 94th percentile. He gets a job at an elite firm. He works 80 hours a week. He never sees his kids. His marriage falls apart. <laughs> Tortoise, by contrast, and I'm going to say Tortoise is a, a woman for no particular reason, but she is uh, super anal. She doesn't do things quickly. She, whenever she uh, has a hard question, she goes over it 17 times. There is no way Tortoise can finish all of the answer, answer all the questions in the time allotted. So she only gets to 80 questions, of which she answers 78 correctly. She has an accuracy rate of 97.5, uh, but she makes so many guesses that she gets penalized. She ends up with an LSAT score of 165, which is the 94th percentile. She gets a job in an elite firm. She works 80 hours a week. She never sees her children. Her marriage falls apart, and she quits the law. Okay. The LSAT will tell you that these two people, hare and tortoise, are identical. They both got a score of 165. But who would you rather have as your lawyer? Would you like to call up hare and say, have you gotten to my contract yet? And hare tell you, yeah, I looked at it over lunch. It's fine, right? No. <laughs> you want tortoise as your lawyer. You want the person who's anal and doesn't skip ahead and blah, 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 right? The, but the purpose, but the, purpose the, the result of creating a speeded power test for the LSAT, the result of having that time constraint, is to make Hare look better than he actually is and Tortoise look worse than she actually is, right? Why would we do this in a profession that is based on Tortoise thinking? I was actually so baffled by this that I went to see the organization that runs the LSAT 
big fancy office building in New Jersey, huge conference room. They all gathered, and I, I just said to them, can you explain to me why you have a time limit on the LSAT? It makes no sense. Why not just let them spend all day doing it, right? Ask really hard questions. That's actually what the law is. Hard questions where you take a long time. They charge by the hour, for goodness sake. <laughs> there, is, there is no institutional reason why you would want people to move quickly, right? So, and I have my tape recorder already because I was expecting them to give this long, nuanced answer on the value of this. And their answer was, eh, it's just easier. You know, we can't have, how are you going to rent the hall for the whole day, right? Oh, yeah. <clears throat> Proposition three. Uh, this is a crucial one, uh, particularly for the kind of intellectual work that we do in the modern economy. Um, this is about uh, surgeons. Now, we're all familiar uh, with the, um, the observation that the more operations a surgeon does, the more procedures they do, the better they get. There is a learning curve with surgery. That's why we tend to have rare surgeries important surgeries uh, clustered at major teaching hospitals so we can keep the volume of the surgeon um, up really high, right? You don't go and get some kind of very particular brain surgery at some rural hospital. You go to the major medical center for this very reason. Um, so this is a chart demonstrating this. Norbert operations are a particular kind of very difficult pediatric um, cardiac surgery, and you can see the learning curve. With your, uh, your, if you're under like 150 cases a year, uh, your mortality rate is really high. I mean, that's it's terrible. But once you get to about 400 a year, the mortality rate comes down dramatically by, you know, it's a quarter of what it would be uh, otherwise. This is a pattern that we see um, throughout all of surgery. And the people who are on this end, right, are the ones who get rewarded, they're the ones who make the most money, they're the ones who have the fanciest titles, those are the ones who are the winners of the meritocratic game that is uh, uh, academic medicine. Um, okay, but there is a complication with this, um, and that is what happens to the people, the surgeons, who do their Norwood operations at a different hospital? So lots of surgeons do this, right? You have privileges at more than one hospital. Maybe you do 90% of your procedures at one place, but then you go down the street or across town on the weekends or whatever, and you do some at another place. And the answer is that when you leave your regular hospital and moonlight somewhere else, you move from being at this end of the curve and you go all the way back to the other end of the curve. This is a, a, a result beautifully demonstrated in this paper. I'm going to read to you the, uh, the, uh, the conclusion. Higher volume in a prior period for a given surgeon at a particular hospital is correlated with significantly lower risk-adjusted mortality for that surgeon hospital pair. That's what they're talking about, like that. That volume, however, does not significantly improve the surgeon's performance at other hospitals. What does that mean? Well, what that means is that cardiac surgery, or any kind of complex surgery, is a team activity, right? So when you're with your team, at your regular hospital, you all get better together. But then when you leave on the weekend to moonlight somewhere else, you leave your team behind, and without your team, you're hopeless, right? Now, does the meritocratic system recognize that uh, being a really good surgeon is not an individual accomplishment, but a team accomplishment? No, it doesn't, right? The whole meritocratic system is based on the assumption that what we're observing here is the greatness of this particular individual surgeon. Right? Now, I would suggest to you that that's a pretty big problem, particularly if you're someone who picks your elite surgeon and just happens to see, be seeing that surgeon at the hospital that they're moonlighting at, moonlighting at and not their regular place. And I think that this applies to an extraordinary number of complex uh, mer uh, allegedly meritocratic systems. I mean, uh, think about me up here right now. How much of this talk is me? Do you know whether I wrote it or whether the team wrote it, right? You don't know. You have no idea how good I am based on this, this particular talk that I'm giving you without knowing the, the actual process that I used to come up with these observations. Okay, proposition number four. Um, meritocracies are bad because gatekeepers don't fix them. Right? So, if you would think, if you, once you realize that there, are this, there is this accumulating body of knowledge that suggests that we're not very good at managing 
uh, meritocracies, then you would assume then that there should be an ongoing process by which we try and improve the quality of the gatekeeping function. Um, and it turns out that uh, there isn't. So again, a million examples, but this is one I've been obsessed with for a while. I actually wrote about it in my book, Outliers, back in 2008. Um, this is the roster of the uh, 2007 Medicine Hat Tigers. This is the actual chart I used in my book, Outliers. And this is, uh, this is a uh, major junior A hockey team. So this is one rung below the NHL. And the point of this, those of you who've read Outliers will know this, the point of this chart was that this is a group of elite hockey players in a country that takes hockey very seriously. And what is most striking about this group is how many of them are born in the first four months of the year, right? February, January, March, January, December, January, January, March, April, September, October, April, and January, January, August, March, May, January, right? This is, now this is a very, very well-known phenomenon. It's called the relative age effect, and it's a function of the way in which we select we, we, the way in which we um, structure the particular meritocracy that is elite youth sports. We, in Canada, they're crazy about hockey, so they get, start uh, forming all-star teams at the age of nine, right? And at the age of nine, the kids who look like they're the best hockey players are the ones who are relatively the oldest, right? So the cutoff is January 1st. If you're born in January, you're gonna look better than a kid born in December. So we take that kid out, and we put them on an all-star team and we give them way more practice time, way better coaches, way more access to good competition, way more encouragement, and lo and behold, 10 years later, they actually are the best. An arbitrary advantage has been elevated to a real advantage. Now, you can see this everywhere. It's in, true in soccer, it's true in uh, basketball, and swimming, any competitive sport that uh, looks to develop and identify talent at an early level at an early age, has the problem of creating these, uh, these uh, relative age effect arbitrary advantages. So for example, take a look at this. Uh, same thing is true in schools. This is a study of, um, of, uh, of gifted and talented programs in England. Um, and we, they have broken down the composition of gifted and talented programs by birth a cohort. In England, the cutoff is uh, September 1st. And what you see is that if you are in the relatively youngest cohort of your class, your chance of being in a gifted and talented program in science and math is roughly half that of, the, uh, of, of, the, of, of those uh, who were born in the relatively oldest cohort. Basically, if your kid is among the youngest in your class, kiss goodbye to getting into a gifted and talented program. And of course, we use gifted and talented programs to decide who gets into quality schools, and we use quality schools to decide who gets all kinds of advantages, on and on and on and on, right? It's the same old system. So uh, this is not a meritocracy. This is simply something that's pretending to be a meritocracy. So I wrote my book in 2008. And as a result of the long stuff about the relative age effect in my book, there was a lot of kind of public attention to this particular um, uh, relative age effect. So I thought when I was coming here to talk about meritocracies, that what I would do is revisit the hockey example and give you, show you about how this particular Canadian institution, I'm Canadian, it's important to me, has learned its lesson and fixed its ways and no longer pursues a policy that has the, uh, has the misfortune of leaving half the talent on the table. So I decided I would look at the 2022 Canadian junior hockey roster. And uh, let's just go through the birth months, shall we? September, November, June, March, January, January, April, September, January, August, September, July, October, January, February, January, August, April, October, January, March, January, March, February, January. They have learned nothing, right? <laughs> nothing. They haven't done a single thing to fix the problem. F 15 years ago, it was brought to their attention that a country that was more passionate about hockey than almost anything else was, had created a system that was arbitrarily leaving half the talent on the table, right? This is, no one could possibly be more powerfully motivated to fix this system than Canadians, right? Hockey is the, is, the, is the national everything. Have they fixed it? No, they haven't. By the way, has anyone fixed this system? No, 
I mean, think about your child's elementary school. If they are in first and second grade, do they divide the kids up and put the January to March kids in one class and the April to June kids in another and the July to September kids in another? No, they don't do that, right? Even though we've had years and years and years of evidence that it's completely unfair to ask a January kid to compete with a December kid. When, you have, when your child does, uh, 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 takes a standardized test, does, it, does a child take, do the kids born in December take the standardized test on the same day as the kids born in January? Yes, they do. Does that make any sense whatsoever? No, it doesn't, right? For some reason, we are powerfully incurious about the problems that we have created with our meritocracies. We think we know a good research proposal from a bad one, and we don't. We think we know that we think we're selecting the right people for law school, and we aren't. We, you know, we, we, we think we know that uh, an individual is responsible for their surgical success, and they aren't. And when we're presented with evidence of the falsity of our, of our uh, systems, what do we do? We do nothing. Now, I said at the beginning that this observation about our failed meritocracies is a very good thing. Um, how can that be? If we fixed meritocracies, then most of us wouldn't be here, right? <laughs> but think about it. If we fix the system, the people who would replace us at a conference like this would be so much smarter than we are. This conference would have been so much more fun, Google would make so much more money, and I wouldn't be here. Someone far more gifted than I would be giving this talk, and it would have been infinitely more interesting.